Welcome to RGBA, Colorful Tech News and Reviews. This is episode 57. My name is Alexandre Valier-Lagasse, and I'm joined by my co-host, Terminal. So we start off this week with a bit of follow-up from last week. We talked about um, iOS 11 do not disturb while driving mode. And we were curious if it worked um, in the train, and the metro, and you even you wanted to see if it worked when you were on your skateboard. And we yeah. can confirm that it works. Well, not yeah, it turns on, I mean, when we're in the train, when I'm in the train. So that's a kind of an annoying part. Already it's annoying when you're a passenger in a car and, it, and it's always on. But it also works in the train if you're between stops. So that's kind of weird too. And it also works when you're riding your skateboard. If there's a one stretch of road when I go to work that is a bit downhill, so I can go maybe 20 to 24, 25 kilometers per hour. And just that stretch, I raised my watch and I've seen, I've saw the little uh, moon icon. So it does kick in also when you're just skateboarding, skating, and I'm guessing bicycling also. So, yeah, it's not uh, very smart. It it basically just realizes that the phone moves fast and then enables. That's basically it, I guess. It, for the train, it'd be easy because you can see if he's on a road or not. For the skateboard, you're already on, you're sometimes on a road, so I guess it's harder. Same thing for passenger yeah. in a car, but... Yeah, but I don't think it it's that smart. Like, the background process, whatever, that uh, watches your status basically has access to the sensor data but probably does not load like maps and try to do location. a yeah location like a pinpointing and then realize okay because you're right here at this moment you seem to be on the road so let's activate no it doesn't go that far i think it's probably like they said in the in the keynote there's a bluetooth component so basically if your car bluetooth uh is, activated. Uh, is on is activated and you're you're using it it basically learns that i can stop it can it can stop figuring it out using the gps and use that information when it connects to the bluetooth but when there's no bluetooth it's basically just the, the speedometer i guess the accelerator see how fast the gps how fast they're going i would assume that if you're active like running or skateboarding or cycling maybe you can realize that the phone moves way too much for you to be driving it's probably safe to assume that you're doing some sport kind of sport so I would not like turn it on in those situations. Does it turn off if you run? I haven't run in a while, so I, I don't know. What happens if you <laughs> run at a good pace and then, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really don't really that. want to test that one. You can test that one this week. Yeah, no, not think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll skip, I'll skip. <laughs> yeah. One more thing that we discussed last week, um, we were discussing the camera settings where you can set the resolution and the frame rate for when you're uh, recording video on the new iPhone with, well, on the recent iPhones with iOS 11. And when you looked it up and you saw the number of megs per second, which were 170 megs, I was surprised that it was that low because I was remembering that it was way more than that. And yes, I compared screenshots with the iOS 10 version which basically accounts for the same resolution, same frame rate, so 4K 30 FPS, which was 350 megs per second. So right off the bat, we get a gain of 50% less space use when recording videos just because they're moving to the HEIF and HEVC codecs for the photos and videos. So that's uh, pretty impressive. I don't know exactly how these formats work. I just heard that they're good, but I, I think I need to read up on them. Yeah, well, the thing that I've read about those, because uh, I discussed this with, uh, who was it? Was it? Uh, I think it was the guys from Image Optum on the on their GitHub uh, repo. Uh, I asked like if they could add support for that, and they basically responded that the HEVC and HEIF formats are basically like a big catch-all kind of format, meaning that it the very the very exact format encompasses like. A bunch of little features like uh, like you know the uh, Apple does with the live photos. Uh, there's a bunch of special metadata. There's a bunch of other types of data you can embed in the format. 
But the, the bad thing is that the format itself includes all of those things. So that, which means that if you want to play, render, process, optimize, or whatever the format, you need to implement all the features. So in basic, it's basically like implementing like 10 different file formats in one. So it's not just a container like a, uh, for videos, the MKV container, the Matrovska container. It's basically like a dumb container and can contain any types of video file with any codecs. It's very simple to implement. It's just like a header and footer of the binary file. But in this case, for HEVC and HIEIF, there's like maybe 10 or 12 different types of um, technologies, if you want, that you have to code in your app. And you cannot just say, I'm going to support it, but it's just half of it, because you might end up with an other file that has this exact data, and you're just going to strip it and break the file. So it's more it's more complicated complicated than I was expecting. I was expecting more of a kind of like Google's Gwetzli, which is a algorithm for compressing JPEG that gives you thirty percent less space. Um, but in this case, it's it's yes, there's this compression part. There's also the file definition. There's also all the features. There's also so it's like it's huge. That's why it's uh, quite complex to implement. Moving on to news, uh, the very first news. Uh, which is very good for people having an Apple Watch first generation. Uh, Apple is still covering the repairs for the detached back cover. This came up uh, in October of 2016 uh, when Gruber had his very own Apple Watch cover. Uh, his wife. Like un his wife's, okay. And uh, the cover basically just by putting on it on the charging cable and removing it, just this magnetic field was enough to remove the cover from the watch. So of course it was fixed by Apple, that's fine. And Apple seems to think that there are still some watches with the same problem, probably because they know the serial number and they don't want to do a recall for everything and because it might or might not happen. So they are extending uh, free repairs for the first you know, uh, Apple Watch like that. So that's a good thing if you have one. If you see that there's one corner that starts to, to unglue, uh, don't wait and just get it fixed. There's no corners because it's a circle. Did I say corner? Yeah, that's corner. <laughs> wow, <laughs> circles and corners, man. It's so 2070. I think it's more common on the stainless steel watches. Probably, yeah. Maybe the ad maybe the adhesive is doesn't stick as well on to the uh, stainless steel as it does on the rougher surface of the aluminum. It happens on both, but I think it's more common on the stainless steel. If mine comes off, will they change my battery too at the same time? I don't know if they just swap the watch or if they really repair it. I don't think they repair it. I think they're going to swap it with a refurbished unit. They they still have refurb of first gen? They still have refurb of iPhone 5C when I bought my 7. Okay. There was somebody in front of me at the Apple Genius Bar, which was there with the... It was a, a lady with her daughter. And I don't know what happened. I think she dropped the phone or whatever and she had Apple Care. So the, the, the rep looked at this and said, okay, uh, we'll switch it uh, this time, but next time don't do it. I think because she, she had Apple Care, but I think she already used the the, the first accidental broke uh, thing there, fifty dollar thing, break thing. Yeah. thing. Yeah, whatever. So the the the, the genius was kind enough to fix it no with no charge, and took like a a sleeve from the desk, and it was a a five C that was uh, refurbished. So that was uh, that was last uh, autumn. So it was like four years after the release of the phone or something. So three, four years. So yeah, they still have those in stock for a while. I can't imagine the, the inventory they have to hold. Yeah, because especially for the, these products, there was like a five, six colors. So it's, uh, it, it's, it gets complicated. Then in other news, we also have PayPal is now going to be an official uh, method payment for the iPhone for everything like uh, associated with your Apple ID. So App Store, Music Store, and all that. Right now, it's only credit card, or I don't think we have debit card here, maybe in the States. But yeah, not yet. But they also support PayPal now. It's going to be available in the US, Canada, uh, UK, Mexico, Australia, Austria, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of um, countries. Yeah, it's pretty useful when, when, especially if you're a freelancer and you get paid via PayPal, then you save like the two days it takes for your money to get, get transferred to your bank account. So that's cool. It can all stay in the cloud and just move around like that. One of the news that was pretty interesting, I really love those type of news where people actually like dig like deep down in iOS code and try to understand some feature of the OS. 
uh, you know those iTunes gift cards uh, or iTunes uh, app promo card. They usually have like a little scratch section where you scratch off a little gray, set, a gray thing and you get a code that's revealed. You basically use your phone and you can scan the code. So it, it, was, it has been working like that for many years. Uh, I remember in 2007, I was doing, doing the same thing with the webcam of my Mac, scanning a, a promo card like that. So it's it, it's been like very it's been there for for a long time and nobody really wondered how it worked but the equinox the company behind mail designer pro 3 actually dug deep into that exact thing and they discovered that there's two fonts that are hidden deep down in the ios ecosystem where it's in the core recognition framework the first one is called uh, scan cardium and the second one is called spend cardium so these are two fonts that are system font um, you can get them on the internet and then move them to your uh, Mac uh, uh, Mac computer very easily. Uh, the cool thing is that Apple only scans for this specific font. So if, let's say, you try to make it recognize any type of font, even like those OCR-enabled font uh, that are very easy to recognize by a computer, it won't work. You need exactly this specific font. So what does it give you if now that we have those two fonts? Well, basically, you can now create custom promo cards that you can hand out at events or uh, at meetups or whatever so that uh, you can have your very own uh, Apple kind of promo card with the code and the iPhone will be able to scan it with no problem. So that's uh, pretty, pretty nice. Uh, yeah, the links will be shown if you want to, uh, to read more about it. And even even went one step further and actually did templates for Sketch and Photoshop to help you with that. How does it work after that? Like, I generate a code, I give it to you, but how do you? How does the App Store know that this code is for a free app or something like that? No, the, the code has to be generated by you as you would normally do, uh, uh, either by using it. a third, yeah, I think Scanet or a third-party uh, client. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, just just by it's just a way to basically print that code on a card and that's it so pretty nice stuff for ios developers okay i get it now moving on to rumor corner this week um apple really wants the iphone 8 to ship uh, that's a given uh, so they even went then went one step further is that some suppliers have problems with uh, some parts and to be able to secure a good enough quality and a good enough quantity of those parts Apple went the extra mile and basically lended them some hardware, some machinery to help them with the uh, PCB and other uh, very uh, important components so that they are kind of reserved for Apple because Apple lends them some some uh, some expertise if you want. And yeah, so that that will basically like reserve a um, a much larger quantity of the components for them so that they don't have any problem when they launch the iPhone 8 and they don't have a situation where they can't make enough of them at once. I think that's the first time they did that. They often invest money. And uh, let's say that there's a glass company who makes the iPhone glass. Uh, they're going to say, okay, here's $1 billion, create a new plant, and we want X number of millions of glass screens per year for us. And then afterwards, you can serve your own customers. So that's a good thing because the company has investment, which is not tied to giving up equity of the company or anything like that. It's just that it's as long as they give whatever production they need to Apple, and then the plan can be used after that, probably in the last six months of the year, f to fulfill any customer orders. So that's pretty pretty the usual stuff that they do. Uh, now leasing equipment is kind of a first, so it's it's it's, it's interesting to see that they really want to make this happen. Moving on to a Pixel-related news, well, rumor, um, there was a leak this week of the future 2017 Google Pixel XL. Um, it was like a high-quality render image, so it's pretty nice to see that it's very close to the final product. Uh, it can still change over the next couple of months, uh, but uh, just looking at it, it's, it's very nice looking. The biggest change is the form factor. So instead of the usual 16 by 9 format, they now have a 2 by 1 aspect ratio for the for the screen. Uh, it's very close to the LG G6, but they also say that it's the LG is the manufacturer for the Pixel this time. 
Um, so you can probably expect it to feel in your hand uh, to be much, much close to the LG G6. The fingerprint reader is on the back. There's a bigger lens for the camera. Uh, the screen is uh, high. The, well, the chin and the and the, the forehead are very uh, much smaller. And not as small as the iPhone 8 Pro renders we've seen, but uh, very, very nice looking still. Um, yeah, I uh, just hope that, yeah, it still has a, a on-off button on the side, which the LG G6 does not have. You have to click on the fingerprint sensor. So that's a bit uh, wonky in my opinion. So this one doesn't have that. It still has its side button, so that's good. Uh, no pictures of the regular Google Pixel. So we don't know if there's going to be a regular and an Excel or just one that's the new Excel. Um, there's no also names. It's basically just a render. So we don't know if they're going to call it the Pixel 2, the 2 Pixel or the Pixel Square. I don't know. So We don't see a lot of pixels. I think I saw like three or, four, or three, four on my commute. Yeah, it's a sad thing because it, 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 the price, that's the main problem. It's very expensive in Android terms at the very least. So people don't tend to get those. They always tend to get the cheaper Samsung. And just once they get like a Galaxy S something, they tend to renew with a new one every couple of years. So, and the price difference is quite large. So I'm hoping that for the Pixel 2, maybe they, they find a way to lower the price. Uh, in this case, if it's LG who's making it, and maybe they piggyback on the LG G6 design, they might be able to drop the price a bit. But for me, the Google Pixel XL is the way to go for Android. I love the form factor. I love the shape. I love the sizes. Uh, I love the OS. It's very, very good. If I had to switch to Android, this would be the, the device I would get for sure. So, And coming from an iOS uh, fanboy like me, it's a, it's a big thing, thing to say. Do you know when it's going to be released? I think it's like a couple of weeks before the iPhone 8 event, right? Yeah, the, the original one was unveiled in October. So I'm guessing maybe they're going to do an event just before the iPhone uh, 8 event. Try to, I don't know, maybe squeeze in a few pre-orders like that. Uh, or maybe after, we don't know. Uh, yeah, one more feature that it has that I forgot to mention is the squeeze uh, frame the squeeze uh, feature. I don't know what you can call that. HTC calls it the edge sense, but it's basically a feature where you just squeeze the phone in your hand, and just by applying some pressure on the sides, it can act as a shortcut to a bunch of actions of your choosing. So it, it it's calibrable. Also, you can also make it like react with less or more pressure, but it's kind of like a I don't know like a fourth button or something. That's weird. I'm not yeah, sure it's, about it's that weird. One. Yeah, you should, probably should try it. I've seen a review from um, MKBHD of the HTC U11, and it looks to be interesting. I'm not sure I'm going to... It's the kind of feature that I would use a lot, uh, especially for what? Maybe just to launch a camera, which is now basically just a raise to wake and swipe, right? So it's not as if it was complicated right now on iOS to do that. So, yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see that in a couple of months for sure. So I don't know if you have any other things. It's been a slow week. There's not much news. Nope. Nope. All right. Uh, no reviews from me. Uh, very busy at work. So we can no time talk to. We can talk about the like the betas or expanse with the betas. Yeah. Yeah. True. Beta three was released for iOS last week, and the watchOS three beta was released this week. Uh, you installed both, right? Yeah, I have both now. Any any major problems? Um, I feel like I didn't see any difference on the phone. And it's only been like two or three days on the watch. The, my biggest problem was when we were on beta 3 on the phone and beta 2 on the watch. Then all the notifications were just out of whack. I'd get, yeah. you'd get the notification on the phone and a second later you'd get it on the watch and vice versa. It was, it was a mess. But now that's back. That's okay. Yeah, it it, it was something because you, you you don't think to realize it, but you get used to your wrist vibrating and not your pocket. And then out of a sudden, one notification comes in. It's in the pocket. The other one is in the watch. Then it's a, I don't know, like a calendar notification. It's on the watch, and then on the the phone later on. It's it's it was a mess. So it was uh, quite painful. I did install both my uh, both of those beta my myself. Uh, 
I've seen basically no changes on the iOS side. I'm pretty sad because usually beta 3 starts to get pretty stable and you can see like a big difference from uh, beta 1 and 2. But in this case, it's as, as unstable as the previous betas. Uh, wherever I had problems with copy pasting, it still crashes. Uh, and the workflows that I have that don't work, they still don't work. So that's bad. Uh, I still have lots of problems with the App Store, like trying to install apps. It just shows a throbber and just loads and never pops me up with the uh, Apple Pay uh, model. So that sucks. Um, for the watch, uh, I don't have the same battery problems that you do, uh, but I only installed it this last night. So I'll have to see if this watch OS beta is better. But uh, yeah, um, I'm really looking forward like a very, very mo uh, much more stable beta. And for example, yesterday I was trying to use Google Maps to as a GPS in my uh, in my car, and I was only getting the backdrop that is the uh, the lined backdrop. There was no field and nothing. And even if I uh, force restart the app, it was not working. I had to force restart my my, my phone to get it to work. But when you're driving, it's not the best thing. So I had to stop a couple of times around the road just to raise the, the, the to restart the phone. So that, that sucks a lot. Very looking forward to beta 4. And I hope this time we'll get the beta for iOS and watchOS at the same time. Yeah. And they have to change the way the, the, um, we install updates on the phone. No, watch. It's so painful. Yeah. It never yeah. it never works on the first try. Yeah, same for me. Uh, for some reason, the, the well, there's always like two, two screens with the watch and the circle going around. The first one usually is fine, then it restarts, but then it does the second one, and that's when it always fails for me. And for example, this this night, last night when I installed the the, the watch, uh, the, the the iOS beta on it, not iOS, sorry, the watch OS beta on it, uh, I placed it on my dock, and it did its, its job. But it was stuck at one hundred percent, and it kept it, it stayed the whole like, like that the whole night. So when I woke up this morning, it was still showing me the circle with the the apple, and I had to force restart the watch, and then it was okay. So yeah, they they should they really should do something about that. Because now it's all happening over Bluetooth, like the download it on the phone, it transfers it over to the watch, and then it installs. But I think it it failed like three times for me too. You know what I want? I want a cable that goes from the Apple Watch yeah. uh, magnetic connector to the Lightning port. That just connection. like a, a f yeah, just a four inch cable, just just so I can put them on my desk, plug them together, and say go, and the update will be faster and probably more reliable, uh, unless you remove it from the cable. But still, uh, I would really love that kind of stuff to happen because it would be much much easier. Uh, there's so much problems using the wireless. Bluetooth for that, that it doesn't make it nicer. All right, so that's it for this week. You can find the show notes at rgba.fm slash 57. You can find us on Twitter at underscore rgbfm. My personal account on Twitter is Valia, V-A-L-L-I-E-R-E-S. I'm Tyler Menard, T-Y-L-E-R-M-E-N-A-R-D. Have a nice week. Have a nice week.